gravitational waves are pretty awesome. Uh, these were a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity, and Einstein himself made the prediction but thought that these would never be detectable because gravity by itself is by far the weakest of the forces, and gravitational waves are just tiny little perturbations, tiny little changes on top of that already weak force, so they are almost infinitesimally small. So Einstein thought, yeah, this is cool, this is an interesting consequence of this awesome theory that I just made, but no one's ever gonna actually detect these or measure them. Fast forward half a century later and people begin building measurement devices to actually see a gravitational wave. Now, these gravitational wave detectors have to be incredibly, incredibly precise because even the most powerful gravitational waves that pass over us every day, say an atom no bigger than its own, the width of its own nucleus, these are incredibly tiny changes. And remember, gravitational waves are waves of gravity. They are literally waves of gravity. These are ripples in space generated by basically everything. If you start waving your arm around, you are generating gravitational waves, uh, but just not very strong ones. Uh, even the biggest, biggest gravitational waves, you know, those ones that move an atom no bigger than, no more than the width of its nucleus, even those are generated by the most massive, compact objects in the universe. We're talking about things like black holes themselves. You need incredibly powerful, incredibly massive, incredibly strong sources of gravity to generate appreciable levels of gravitational waves. And our universe is soaked in gravitational waves, just like it's soaked in electromagnetic radiation. We we'll have all sorts of different frequencies and light uh, and infrared and x-ray. We have all sorts of gravitational waves passing through us every single moment. The first experiment to finally detect gravitational waves is LIGO, the Laser Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is the one that got started over a quarter century ago and took almost 25 years of continual upgrades and improvements before they could reach the accuracy and precision needed to finally detect gravitational waves. And since then, they found dozens of gravitational wave events from merging black holes, one merging neutron star, a few merging neutron star and black holes, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, LIGO is a fantastic experiment, a fantastic device, but it is limited in what it can see in the gravitational wave universe. It's limited to relatively high frequency, short duration events. And that's because these experiments are on the ground. They're on the surface of the Earth. And these experiments, they're trying to measure differences uh, in distances to less than an atomic nucleus Anything that shakes that experiment will contribute a source of noise. So earthquakes around the world, LIGO can detect them. A truck rumbling by on the freeway, LIGO can detect it. Someone walking down the hall and sipping their morning coffee, LIGO can detect it. That's how sensitive these instruments are. And so it's the best way we can use an instrument like LIGO is to detect the high frequency, short duration events. When two black holes merge, the emission of gravitational waves is over and done with in a second. And it's very, very high frequency so that if you have this low level rumble background of noise caused by earthquakes and people walking down the hall and trucks and the wind outside the building and everything, then when a black hole comes by or the gravitational wave from a black hole comes by, it's comes and goes very, very quickly, and so you get a very, very high signal to noise, and you can capture that event. But it does have its limitations. It can't see low frequency gravitational waves or detect low frequency gravitational waves because when the 
waves themselves are much longer and take days or weeks or months to rise and then fall again, LIGO can't pick it out of the noise. It can't pick it out of all that general rumble in the background. Let's get ready to rumble. So this has a lot of parallels to traditional astronomy. If you build a telescope, it will be sensitive to a very narrow number of wavelengths or a frequency band of the kind of electromagnetic radiation that it can see. And you tune that instrument so that it's best at observing that, source of electromagnetic radiation so you can understand what's generating generating it because you're interested in that observing target, that kind of astronomy, that kind of physics, etc. With gravitational wave observatories, we've only opened up one window so far, the high frequency window, that give us access to merging black holes, merging neutron stars, and black hole neutron star mergers. But there are a lot of other sources of gravitational waves out there in the universe, especially low frequency gravitational waves. For example, the kinds of black holes that LIGO can see merging are stellar mass black holes. These are a few times the mass of the sun up to a few dozen times the mass of the sun. But there are much larger black holes out there, the supermassive black holes. These things are millions or billions of times more massive than the sun. Kind of a big deal. And when they emerge, it's not over and done with in less than a second. It can take months, years for these black holes to slowly spiral in towards each other. And they, in the process, they are releasing enormous amounts of gravitational waves. But because this process, this churning is so much bigger and so much slower, the waves have much, much lower frequency. There's also the case of black holes, giant black holes, eating material, like a star wanders too close to a black hole and it gets torn to shreds and then consumed. This is a very long process where the material gets swept around again and again in orbit around the black hole. This releases a lot of gravitational waves, but of very low frequency. There's also the early universe itself. In the earliest moments of our universe, cosmologists believe that it underwent a period of rapid expansion known as inflation. And at the end of the inflation, the universe shook. And when it shook, it released gravitational waves that can, that can be present in the present day universe. They can still exist, but these gravitational waves are going to be severely redshifted. They're going to be long. And so these are going to be outside of the limit of what LIGO can see. We could have a million LIGOs with much higher precision, and they simply won't be able to capture these low frequency events. So what we need in order to capture low frequency gravitational wave events are pulsars. You see, pulsars serve as a natural, nature's own gravitational wave detector. And it works like this. Uh, pulsars uh, are neutron stars that are spinning and they have very strong magnetic fields. These very strong mag magnetic fields drive the emissions of, of jets that come out of the north and south magnetic pole. But the north and south magnetic pole of the neutron star is not always aligned with the spin axis. It's the same on the Earth. Our magnetic north pole does not line up with our geographic north pole. And so this jet of radiation, instead of just pointing in one direction, draws little circles like this. And then if we're the Earth observing out in the universe and we happen to lie on the path of the circle, so you're the Earth right now, I'm the pulsar, keep up with the metaphor. I'm shooting my beam of radiation. It's going to point to you. And then again, and then again, and again. From our perspective, we'll see a flash, 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 a pulsation of light or a pulsar. If it doesn't line up, if it's just spinning like this, then we don't see a pulsar, we just see a normal neutron star. So it has to depend on very lucky alignments. Thankfully, neutron stars are very common in the galaxy and we see a lot of pulsars. Now, to make a pulsar a gravitational wave detector, we need very, very accurate measurements of that pulsation period. And a typical pulsar that pulses every few seconds or every few minutes isn't accurate enough because they do slowly over time slow down. 
is not by much, but it's enough that we can measure it. And every once in a while, the crust of the neutron star can reconfigure itself, it can snap, it can rearrange, we call these glitches, where the pulsation frequency of the pulsar will suddenly shift into a new frequency, and so you, you lose that information. But if we had a very accurate pulsar, we could use it as a gravitational wave detector. And that's because the pulsar is acting like a clock in the very distant universe. We know when the next pulse should arrive. If we see a bunch and we know, okay, we've got a pattern here, we know when the next pulse will arrive, and then imagine a gravitational wave passing over the Earth or passing near the pulsar or passing between us. What do gravitational waves do? They, they change distances. If the gravitational wave passes through, it might shorten the distance between us and the pulsar. And when that happens, the next pulse will arrive a little bit earlier because the light that was, that was emitted by the pulsar has less distance to travel before it reaches us. Or if we're on the opposite end of the gravitational wave and the distance between us and the pulsar is stretched out a little bit, then the light will have longer to take and it will be a little bit delayed. So if we look at one particular pulsar, Again and again and again, we can look for changes in that arrival time of the light and use that to reconstruct the gravitational waves that have passed through us, through us, through the pulsar, the space between us. Unfortunately, one pulsar isn't going to do the trick. Uh, we don't have accurate enough information or measurements of one particular pulsar. And the pulsar has to be exceedingly accurate because of the kind of gravitational waves that we're looking for. We're talking about changes in arrival time of order like 10 nanoseconds, which is not a long, long time at all. So you need incredibly precise pulsars. If it's glitching or slowly drifting, that will swamp out the signal that you'll get from gravitational waves. So we need a specific kind of pulsar called millisecond pulsars. These are pulsars that have been respun up from donation of gas from a companion star. They go super, super fast, pulsa pulsation rates of order a few milliseconds, and we have accurate timing measurements that are compatible or comparable with atomic clocks. These are incredibly precise instruments. These are nature's own atomic clocks. They have the precision necessary for us to be able to cha measure changes of the order of 10 nanoseconds. But one just isn't enough because you can't tell just from one if the changes in the pulsation rate are due to gravitational waves or changes in the pulsar or measurement error or anything like that. So you need to observe multiple pulsars at once. And then if the gravitational wave washes over you, you'll see this set of pulsars over here, they'll change. And then you'll see this set of pulsars over here change too. And so by connecting those two together, by finding a correlation between the changes in pulsation rate of groups of pulsars, you, you can use that to measure a gravitational wave. And this is the key idea behind pulsar timing arrays. The arrays does not refer to an array of telescopes, but an array of pulsars that you're all observing simultaneously. Maybe every once a week or so, you're gonna measure each individual pulsar. From that, you'll build up a map. And then as gravitational waves wash through the Earth, wash through the galaxy, you're gonna see correlated changes in the timing of pulsars. Now, this is a great idea, just like LIGO, people, astronomers have been working on this for decades. Uh, they don't quite have a signal yet. There are a few collaborations at Nanograv, the European Pulsar Timing Array, the Indian Pulsar Timing Array, and an international consortium of all pulsar timing arrays. They don't quite have a signal yet. What they're hoping to find soon is not a single event like LIGO finds, but some statistical background understanding of, of how many supermassive black holes merge in the universe over time. 
where all those gravitational waves are all mixing together and we don't yet have the sophistication to pick out one isolated event, but by looking at all the correlations we can build a background picture of how many gravitational waves are passing through the Earth. And because we're only observing them once a week, we're, or so, we are very, very good at capturing the low frequency events. We're talking about gravitational waves that take months or years to cycle through. So the collaborations, especially Nanograv, have announced some detections. They've seen some shifts in the pulsar timings but it doesn't match up with anything we know about gravitational waves, so we're not exactly sure what's going on. And only time will tell if this technique will work, if we'll reach the level of precision and understanding and accuracy necessary in order to unlock low frequency gravitational waves, or if we'll have to go to other techniques like space-based gravitational wave observatories. Either way, nature has provided us an atomic clock, a set of atomic clocks that we can use to measure gravitational waves. And how cool is that? Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.